Hi, everyone. It looks like there is a full house in the house. I am, goodness, can you hear me? Can hear you well. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Vice Chair. Looking sharp there, looking sharp. I don't know who else is in the building, but I'll look good. Um, so with that, we wanna welcome everybody to the May 20th Sandag Public Hearing uh, or Public uh, Safety Committee meeting. Before we get started, I do uh, want to make sure uh, that we do have quorum as well as, I'll pause, do we have quorum? Chair, at this time we don't have a quorum, we just need one more. Okay, so I'll hold my breath and wait until we get that last member joining us. Chair, do you show Chris Brainerd attending? I do see you. Does that mean uh, we have reached quorum staff? Anderson checking in. Perfect. We have quorum now. Outstanding. Well, welcome everyone. Today is May 20th, 2022, and welcome to the May 20th Sandag Public Safety uh, Committee meeting. Uh, before we get started, I would like the interpreter to be introduced and to walk us through how to access uh, our interpretation services for today's meeting. Sure. This is an announcement for on-site participants. If you're joining us today in the Sandag boardroom and need interpretation into Spanish, please check out a receiver from the receptionist on the seventh floor. Simply hold the earpiece to your ear and the interpreter will come on automatically. Buenas tardes. Si se ha unido a la reunión de hoy en la sala de juntas de Sandag y necesita interpretación al español, por favor, diríjase a la recepción del piso 7 y solicite un receptor. Simplemente sostenga el auricular junto a su oído y la interpretación comenzará automáticamente. Um, the following instructions are for people joining the meeting remotely. Para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, Por favor, desplácese a la parte inferior. Por favor, desplácese a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación que es el globo terráqueo y seleccione Spanish, español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom en celular o tableta, presione los puntos suspensivos, luego Interpretation y luego el idioma. Gracias. To use the Zoom interpreting feature, please scroll to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are located. Click on the interpretation icon, which is the world icon, and select English as your language. If you are joining using the Zoom mobile app on a cell phone or tablet, please press the ellipses, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, appreciate that. And again, now I will uh, formally call this meeting to order. Let's go ahead and start with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you could put your right hand over your heart, stand if you're able. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right. Now, uh, again, just want to triple check that we do have quorum. Yes, Chair, we do have quorum. Outstanding, let's get this party started. So with that, I'd like to remind everybody of our process for both um, in-person and, um, or I'm sorry, for member and public comments. Members who are virtual are asked to use the raise hand icon on the Zoom toolbar and to turn on their cameras when they have a question or a comment. And then I'll recognize you. Any comments from individuals who are present at Sunday will be taken first, followed by anyone online. And if you are a member of the public and would like to uh, speak on an item virtually, all you have to do is place, uh, uh, you know, uh, use the raised hand icon in the two Zoom toolbar. And once we reach that item, you will be called upon. Uh, please press star nine on your phone if you'd like to comment on that item if you are calling into the meeting. All comments, whether emailed or live, will be made a part of today's meeting record. 
I'd also like to welcome Chief Craig Carter back to Sandag. Bienvenido. Chief Carter will be our acting artist director until the position is filled. We want to welcome him back and we look forward to working with you, Chief Carter. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, gracias. Well, with that, we go to item one, and that's the approval of the meeting minutes of March 18th through 2022. If there are any members of the public that would like to make a comment on item one, please raise your hand now. We have uh, two members of the public. Uh, okay. Ellis, if you want to go ahead. And we will go three minutes. Oh, three Before. minutes. Yes. Jake. Uh yeah hi, I um I, I had a problem with the public safety like my dog was walking on the street and they got mauled by a bunch of chihuahuas. <laughs> I'm not even kidding, it got mauled. How are we gonna solve this? Uh, that's all I have to say really. And uh. You know, now that I think about it, I might be in the wrong meeting. Anyway, you look like a dirty ass bitch. Fuck you. <laughs> you never can we mute this can we mute this gentleman? Thank you so much. Moving on. Um, and we apologize for any members of uh the participants as well as um uh, uh those joining us uh for that vulgar outbreak. Um, outburst, should I say. Uh, with that, staff, is there anyone else? Uh, yeah, we have a Kurt Bernstickle. Go ahead. Hey, this is Kurt Bernstickle here. Um, so. Okay, I think there is some technical difficulties going on. Um, but we will now move on. Um, were we able to reconnect um, that gentleman? Chair, this is Sandag Production. They've been removed from the meeting. Thank you. You can continue, ma'am. Thank you so much. All right, we now move on to public safety committee member comments. Please raise your hand, let us know. And those that are in the room, I kind of can see you, uh, but if you uh, Here, I'm flag happy. me down. I'm happy yeah. to move approval of the meeting minutes from uh, March 18th. Outstanding. I have a motion from Vice Chair Campillo. Stay here, second. Goble, second. Mr. Goble, second. All those, um, oh wait, well, we do have a motion and a second on the floor. Seeing no further discussion, please call the roll. Chief Sheriff's Association seat A, Chief K is absent. Chief Sheriff's Association seat B is absent. City of San Diego, Vice Chair Campillo. Yes. County of San Diego, Supervisor Joe Anderson. Aye. San Diego County District Attorney, Deputy Chief Investigator Holmes. Yes. East County Council Member Goble. Yes. Regional Fire Emergency Medical Services, Chief Brainard. Yes. North County Coastal, Council Member Blackburn. Ask him to put his vote in the chat. Council Member, can you put your vote in the chat, please? North County Inland, Council Member Frank. Aye. San Diego Police Department is absent. San Diego County Sheriff is absent. South County Chair Mayor Sotelo Solis. Sotelo Solis, aye. And that motion passes with those members present. Outstanding. We now move on to public comments. And again, 
Uh, we encourage all of the members of the public that are addressing us to, um, to recognize uh, all of our meetings are um, being recorded. And we uh, do have decorum for our meetings. Uh, you can, this item is for anything that is not on today's agenda. So Linda, do we have any members of the public wishing to address us on anything that's not on the agenda? Mayor Solis, can I interrupt? This is Blackburn from- Sure. All right, finally, I got logged on. I'm, a, I'm an I for the last vote. Thank you. Out, outstanding, thank you so much. So noted. Staff, you got that? Blackburn, aye. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any members of the public wishing to address us during item two? I have one, Casey Riker. Okay. Go ahead. You're better shit, bitch. <laughs> okay. You're so bad. You're all right well thank you so much we do uh and are going to dismiss that member of the public um this is not the appropriate um type of decorum for our meeting so we move on to um item three so as we um move forward i guess this link may have been part of somebody's uh um social media post this is uh interesting just how we're getting <laughs> these phone calls back to back to back. So uh, item three is the agency report and Dr. Cindy Burke uh, is going to provide us an update. And she is now, the new title is Senior Director of Data Science for Sandeg. And she's gonna share with us an update on key programs, projects and agency initiatives. Go ahead, Dr. Burke. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and everybody um, else on the PSC. Thank you for coming and happy Friday. Um, I'm happy to update you on exciting work happening here at Sandag. As you may have heard, yesterday was Sandag Bike to Work Day. We had 100 pit stops around the region and we recorded more than 6,800 uh, pit stops um, of individuals stopping by on their way uh, to work in the morning. Sandag has hosted this event um, annually for more than 30 years and we're excited to be back after a two year hiatus due to the pandemic. This year, we have opened 11 miles of new bikeways and we plan to start construction on an additional 22 miles within the next year. These projects really transform our streets so that walking and biking are comfortable and safe options for people of all ages and abilities. In other news, um, Sandag traveled alongside Chief Blake Spear, um, Chair Blake Spear, too much public safety, I'm making her a chief, um, <laughs> to San Diego Chamber of Commerce in uh, Sacramento to bring attention to projects that encourage business and job creation in the San Diego Baja region. Last week, our Deputy CEO, Colleen Clemenson, was in Washington, D.C. to attend the Coalition for America's Gateways and Trade Corridors annual legislative trip. And this is an important opportunity for Sandag to participate in national discussions around the goods movement. Earlier this month, Hassan and Colleen attended the inauguration of the Tijuana International Airport's new passenger processing facility at CBX. And as you know, Sandag and Caltrans have been working very closely with our partners on the Otay Mesa East Port of Entry project. And we look forward to continuing our partnership with Mexico to build a brighter future for our binational region. Um, I'm, as I'm sure you've also heard, on May 1st, we launched the Youth Opportunity Pass, which provides free transit to anyone in the San Diego region, 18 years of age and under. And we've been working closely with our partners at the county, MTS and NCTD to get word out about this uh, first of its kind program. We're receiving very positive feedback from across the region. We saw more than 1,500 youth pass signups during April. And that's three times as many signups as we saw between January through March combined. Preliminary numbers from MTS for the first week of the Youth Opportunity Pass show a 20% increase in weekday youth ridership system-wide, including 50% on the trolley and a 35% increase on Saturday. And we appreciate um, this group's uh, support in spreading the word about this opportunity. Uh, speaking of spreading the word, we would also like uh, appreciate your help sharing San Diego County's alternative to incarceration study survey. And that's gonna be something I'll be providing more information um, in a later item. And that concludes my report, uh, Mayor Sotelo Solis. Thank you so much, Dr. Burke. Do we have any questions uh, from members of the committee? 
Yes, thank you, Chair. I have one quick question, uh, Dr. Burke. It, with the uh, youth opportunity passes, that data is obviously incredibly, uh, incredibly uh, encouraging to see the youth taking advantage of it and using public transit. Do we have a sense of where in the county, which portions of, of San Diego are seeing the most use and where we might need to do more outreach to try to get youth in other parts to use it as much? Um, that's an excellent question. I don't have the answer, but I will get it to you. Um, I'm sure our, our team is looking at that, and I will um, get the information back out to you. Thank you very much. Great question, uh, Vice Chair. And I know that MTS is uh, looking to send those data points as well um, to the board members, and I think it, it'd be good to be able to provide uh, those hotspots of where, to your point, where they are. Um, using them from, as well as where we could capitalize and really uh, build up that momentum. As people are just starting to kind of, oh, really? That's cool. Then let me, then, now what, what are the next steps? Uh, that information sharing is essential. So I agree. Um, are there any members of the public wishing to address us on this item? This is for item three. Um, no, no chair, there's no uh, public comment. Thank you so much. Uh, seeing no further discussion, we're actually gonna move on to item four. We are moving along here, troops. Uh, this is a report from the Chief's Sheriff's Management Committee, uh, Chief Chuck Kay from Coronado and the Chief's Sheriff's Management Committee uh, will present a report on recent meetings. So I'll send it over to Chief Kay. Good afternoon. Uh, we met on April 6th in SEDAG's Criminal Justice Research Division and the Argus Division presented the draft public safety budget for fiscal year 2023. The committee recommended the draft budget to the Public Safety Committee. There was no meeting on May 4th, 2022. That is all. I love it, short and sweet. <laughs> well done, Chief. Any questions for the Chief or members of the dais in person or on the dais virtually? Okay, uh, seeing none, we now move on to, thank you again, uh, Chief. We now move on to item five, which is the uh, report from the San Diego County Chief Sheriff's Association. Chief uh, Chris Brainerd from the San, Diego, San Miguel Fire Department will be sharing uh, that update with us. Chief. Good afternoon, I do represent uh, County Fire Chiefs. And I've got a couple of items to share with you. Uh, at our last uh, county chiefs meeting, and we meet once a month where all fire chiefs in the county come together for our chiefs meeting. Summer Steffens came in from the DA's office and made a presentation about the impacts of uh, how mental health and homeless, the impacts on first response. And they've got some strategies and some programs that they're uh, talking to us about so that we can try to better serve the community and overall reduce the call volume from individuals that could more appropriately be uh, served in other means rather than calling 911. So we feel positive about that. The uh, county chiefs also provided feedback to county EMS on the revised Annex D plan that will be coming out shortly. That has to be approved, I believe, at the Board of Supervisors. And then for the wildland, I don't ever want to overplay anything, but our weather is, um, for a third year in a row, we're in near drought conditions. And the way that the high has been sitting off of Northern California for the last three years out in the ocean, it's caused the jet stream to move north. And that's why we see a lot more of our fires in mid California and above. And some things that are already this year, we've already had fires in this county, which is pre-June, which is concerning to us. Uh, we had uh, the significant fire up in Orange County and the reason why I bring that to this table is we normally don't get significant fires as far as vegetation west of I-15. That fire in uh, Orange County was coastal. And to have fire race that fast and uncontrolled, just 200 acres in a short period of time and take out 20 homes is very concerning. That would be a fire equivalent to, you know, overlooking our, our beach communities, La Jolla and so forth. So uh, that is concerning to us. Also, early this year, we've already had major fires in our adjoining states because of the way the jet stream has been changed. It's pushed a lot of the dry weather and our what we call 100 hour and 1000 hour fuels are extremely 
uh, volatile at this point. And we've actually got strike teams from San Diego County op area over in New Mexico, helping them out because they don't have enough resources. We also do mutual aid across our state, which we all know that, but we also do intrastate uh, mutual aid and we're doing that right now. We are expecting a significant fire season and in preparation for that, each year we do what we call a county wildland drill. This year it was held in Valley Center where every fire agency is invited to send units, crews over a three day period. And we basically have a, a mocked up scenario where we put crews through all of the elements of arriving, checking in, safety messages, briefings, deployment out to various types of training. So it's an all day exercise. We do that three successive days to get as many uh, crews in from across the county. And that again was done uh, just this last month and was very successful. So that's the report that I have for you this afternoon, unless there's any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Chief. Really appreciate that update. Are there any questions from um, members of the in-person dais? I don't see any. Uh, any from the virtual dais here? CNN, is somebody touching the microphone? I hear, I hear you. No? Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Chief Brainerd. Really appreciate the update. Uh, this was, again, for information only. We now move on to items. Oh, before I do that, are there any members of the public wishing to address us on item six? Yes, we have one member from the public. Yep. <laughs> Show me. Who's on it? Go ahead when you're ready. Hey, um, personally, I've lost my house to a fire. Okay, thank you again. We now move on to um, items. I have lost my house to a fire. <laughs> Okay, um, I Go think ahead, we are. They've been removed. Go ahead, proceed. Okay, thank you so much. We now move on to item six, and this, it is a draft fiscal year 2023 public safety work program and budget. Uh, Dr. Burke and Craig Carter from Sunday will walk us through uh, the um, program budget. I'll turn it over. And again, I just want to thank members uh, that are in person and that are um, on the dais, as well as staff for monitoring um, you know, the, the behavior <laughs> and the words that are being uh, put out. So thank you. Um, by, uh, it sounds like we are being um, crashed or Zoom bombed as uh, was done early on with um, many uh, public uh, council meetings. Um, but with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Burke and Mr. Carter. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the budget that we'll be sharing with you today is what was released um, through our executive committee and board um, last month. It is a draft budget. There have been some changes, minor changes that were brought to our executive committee um, last week and we'll be going to the board for final approval next week. Um, but the essence of the work that we'll be doing and the numbers here are, are essentially the same for both criminal justice and Argus. If you could go to the next slide, please. So our FY23 proposed budget for criminal justice research is just over 1.89 um, million. Um, you can see the third uh, bar there is our clearinghouse funding. Um, that is our member assessments that come in to support our, our foundational work that we do in criminal justice. We do have a CPI that's applied to that annually and the amount each jurisdiction pays is based on the population of that jurisdiction. That represents about 13% of our um, funding in FY23, and it's really the foundation that enables us to go out and get the other evaluation and project funding for the region. 42% um, of our projects focus on juvenile and juvenile um, uh, diversion, juvenile um, activities uh, to do reform there. 38% um, went to adult-related projects, which I'll be describing more about. And then 7% for our substance abuse monitoring program, or SAM, and that's our project where we go into the jails and talk to local arrestees about their drug use history. Next slide, please. 
So as I mentioned, the clearinghouse really is our foundation for all the other work that we do. In addition to compiling crime statistics regionally, including um, the work that we've done historically on uniform, uniform crime reporting and our transition now to cybers and NIBRs, it also allows us to um, put data out there in actionable formats, providing historical context, trying to tie about what we know are best practices going across um, the state of California and nationally, and putting that out in a variety of different forums. We also serve on local task force and commissions, and our data is um, used to inform those policies and procedures. And then we also um, staff the Public Safety Committee. Um, for every $1 in clearinghouse funds, even more this year, um, we bring in about $5 in grant funding. So again, shows how we try to um, continue to bring to the knowledge of, again, what works best to keep our um, San Diego region a safe place to live. Next slide, please. Um, so what we do with the clearinghouse data, we come to, to hear um, with many of our presentations, but again, work closely with Argus to track crime trends over time. Um, with that SAM study that I mentioned, we do put out a number of um, uh, reports through our clearinghouse function, and that is the only objective measure of drug use in the country. Um, we are able to get an anonymous and confidential urine sample that's tied back, um, that can't be tied back to the individual that we um, talk to, so we're able to look at drug trends over time. Um, we want to really measure what may be people who work out, many of these um, individuals who are on our committee right here today, who may see when they're working um, with the public with um, some of the issues that we have, but we're able to quantify that and bring more money in with grant funding and also understand better what's the effect of our policy, both short and long term. Because all of our staff go through law enforcement um, background checks, we are able to access data that maybe other individuals um, aren't able to because we have those confidentiality agreements in place. Next slide, please. Um, the SAM project, which I uh, mentioned, is about 7% um, of our budget. We are able to go into the facilities around the uh, county for facilities twice a year. We have funding from High Intensity Drug Trafficking um, a Group, which is federal funding. The County of San Diego generously um, supports this project, and then we're also able to use some of our member assessments. And the expenses there, um, we have about 135000 as I as I mentioned, so I really feel like we do a lot with that. It does um, fund our interview to go into the facilities and do the interviews. We kept it going during the pandemic and, and COVID with uh, additional safety precautions, and we're back in again now. Um, we do do the drug testing, and then there's also reimbursement to the Sheriff's Department for the security that they're able to provide for us in the adult facilities. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of our adult projects, we have 10 in FY23. Um, you can see that um, you have a lot of PSN right there, and they're central, um, eastern, southern, and northern, and that's Project Safe Neighborhood. That's funding that's coming out of Department of Justice at the federal level to address gun violence. And we were asked last year to be the fiscal agent because the U.S. Attorney's offices can't accept the funding. Um, so SANDAG is able to get 10% of that funding for the administrative functions and then um, work with grantees across across the state of California for the first time, including southern is San Diego, central is Los Angeles, eastern is Sacramento, and the northern is the San Francisco Bay Area. So we're able to get those dollars out to jurisdictions across the state. And then we were also selected to be the um, a research partner for uh, Southern District and we'll, our compiling, which I'll come back to this group um, or one of our staff on uh, ghost guns and, and gun crime and, and different statistics that have not been compiled previously. Um, so we'll be excited to share that data with you. Alternatives to incarceration, you can see as the second bar, we have um, just under 172,000 in FY23 budgeted. I'll be sharing more about that project, um, which is a county uh, funded effort at, in the last presentation today. Our smart policing project is with the city of Chula Vista and we're looking at RIPA police stop data and how um, the city of Chula Vista can best use that information um, to strengthen community ties. We'll be doing a community survey and helping them with data dashboards as, as we look at that data in real time. Um, our drug policy analysis is better understanding um, individuals who would have been detained um, prior to Prop 47 going to affect what's been their ongoing contact with the system and we'll be finishing that study up. And then uh, human trafficking, housing and reach partnership um, are projects in North County related to providing services to human trafficking victims. Next slide, please. Our juvenile projects, which again, were about 42% of our budget. Um, we have eight projects there. Um, again, uh, 
Three of them are from the state, and those were grants that we wrote um, in a partnership with the City of San Diego, um, the City of Chula Vista, and the City of La Mesa to take advantage of the money that was made available um, through Prop 64, which legalized marijuana for recreational use um, for jurisdictions that um, did authorize the sell and production. And so we're looking at efforts there, um, of youth education efforts related to um, marijuana prevention. Um, JJCPA is a partnership with the Probation Department and uh, community-based organizations around the region, again, from prevention to graduated sanctions, and we've been evaluating that for a number of years. San Diego Promise Neighborhood is um, in partnership with South Bay Community Services, looking at rejuvenating a neighborhood, and, and we're helping with needs assessment as well as ongoing monitoring of statistics. And um, Juvenile Diversion Initiative is with the um, District Attorney's Office, and in that we're trying to look at what's the effectiveness of diverting juveniles from incarceration, from detention in a juvenile facility, keeping them in the community, and offering alternatives. Um, reducing racial and ethnic disparities, we're working with the Probation Department and Court on looking at um, disparities uh, uh, with juveniles, and then our Calvet project is a state-funded project, again, with South Bay Community Services looking at gang prevention um, activities. So I think across all these um, 18 projects, you can see the depth and the breadth of um, the evaluation activities we're doing across the San Diego region with a variety of different partners. Next slide, please. Um, so again, just to kind of sum up before I turn it over to Craig for um, to talk about Argus, our FY23 priorities include continuing to track crime and other statistics, working with the transition to cybers and IBERS, um, continuing to partner with you all to seek grant funding to bring um, funding in to help answer um, questions about what works best in maintaining public safety, um, and then getting that information um, out to the public as well as um, public safety agencies, community-based organizations, and elected officials. Um, so I'm happy to um, turn it over to Craig, and then maybe we could answer questions at the end. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Burke. Uh, next slide, please. And one more. So I'm here to talk to you about the budget for 23 and our priorities. Uh, we're going to continue to transition to the NIBRS as well as CYBRS with the development of a new crime statistics public-facing website and mapping capabilities. Uh, in essence, the NIBRS and CYBRS data collected is a lot more robust than we've had in, in years, and we want to make sure that we have that information pushed out to the public so they can search their neighborhoods or specific crime trends that they're looking for. So we'll continue to work on that transition. Uh, we're also going to work this year in moving the Argus Data Center to the San Diego County Sheriff's Department. Thank you for their help on this. Um, we're going to be also replacing some of our storage systems as well and ensure that the servers continue to operate as we continue uh, for the years to come. We're going to be completing the membership and fee structure assessment that was identified as a, a priority in 2022 to ensure that we have sufficient reserve funding. Next slide, please. As far as agencies fees are concerned, it, it's broken down in, in these core areas, the core membership agencies of police and sheriffs. They will remain unchanged and just pay the JPA user fees. Contract cities, uh, Del Mar and Encinitas and the, and the like, will all remain unchanged as well and pay the JPA uh, fees as well. District Attorney Probation, San Diego Harbor, uh, will also remain unchanged as well. The ex officio agencies increase at 2.88% uh, based on the consumer price index. And then the uh, artist users and network connectivity fees uh, will actually decrease by 2%. A couple of agencies combined efforts. Uh, we had some uh, repetition in there, so they were able to uh, combine efforts and, and that dropped our uh, fees down 2%. Next slide, please. This is the uh, look at the overall categories, uh, mobile grants, enterprise infrastructure admission, administration and maintenance for uh, just about $7.4 million uh, for the 23 year. Next slide, please. So maintenance and support is about $2 million. Uh, that NIBRS, Cybers transition that we talked about uh, is, is ongoing. We were successful in 2021, uh, being one of the first in the United States to, to transition to the NIBRS, and now we're working on the Cybers, which is the California incident-based reporting system. Uh, and then we're gonna work at uh, taking uh, a host servers from the NLEDS data center and moving that over as well to the Sheriff's Department, replacing some of our outdated data storage uh, and then installation and data migration. We're gonna monitor database performance, space and reliability, and then moving some of the uh, inlet stuff that we talked about, as well as the 401B data center over to the sheriff's station. Uh, we're gonna mon maintain and monitor uh, 50 different interfaces throughout the San Diego County area that keeps us connected with our law enforcement partners. 
and uh, our agency record management system, probation courts and traffic and Cal DOJ. It's our job to make sure that we stay compliant with all of their uh, regulations as well as what we're doing uh, just locally. Next slide, please. Maintenance and support is about $2 million. Uh, application and development team are looking to continue with the, the programs that we offer our, our law enforcement partners in the field. Uh, which, you know, surfers and query and data, basically what that allows them to do is to, on their smartphone, have access to that vital information they need in order to make the right decisions in the field. Uh, and then we're gonna continue with our mapping application development project where, uh, where we can actually map the crime trends so we can start to look at, see what's happening on a real-time basis. Uh, we're gonna continue to offer our off-the-shelf off um, software and maintain that. Uh, so our law enforcement partners, again, have the most updated um, software available. Uh, license fees shared by about 50 different agencies within the county, so we're gonna continue to maintain and support them as well. Next slide, please. On the administration side of it, uh, we have project manager, uh, executive oversight and administrative staff, uh, support for Argus governance, public safety committee, chiefs and sheriffs, uh, the public safety community as we are today. Um, as business working group and related tasks, all these individuals and boards help us determine what we need to do in the next coming years and making sure that we're viable in offering what we're offering to our law enforcement partners. Uh, finance, budgeting, accounts payable and receivable audits. Uh, grant man management, which you'll see in a slide coming up here, where a big portion of our uh, funding is from grants. Uh, providing weekly service logs and help desk 24 365. Uh, on all categories, uh, this is when an individual is using one of our platforms or one of our smartphones uh, that they can call that desk and get us get help right away so we don't have a downtime in the field. Um, and we're gonna try to work on finishing the, the member assessment structure fee uh, that we talked about in 2022 uh, and finish that up in 23. Next slide, please. Commit on, continue on the administration piece. Uh, we have contract executions and interagency agreements that we're working on, legal support and public records requests. Uh, we have personnel and human resources and recruitment and rent office phones and supplies that we went through Sandag. So that, that wraps up the administration part. Next slide, please. Uh, I talked a little bit about the Argus Mobiles and what the uh, law enforcement partners use in the field. Uh, we currently support approximately 1,100 mobile devices enabling the officers in the field to connect to Argus, the networks that we uh, supply and, and give them information. Um, they, they have full support. Uh, we pick up the phones, configure the phones, making sure that their uh, cellular plans are accurate and, and available for the location where they're at and provide network connectivity through NetMotion and different VPNs uh, so that again, we don't have that service interruption. Uh, we also comply with multi-factor identification, uh, making sure that we have a second uh, security factor and to configure the phones with Argus to various law enforcement applications uh, that are available through Argus so that they're all very similar in nature. Next slide, please. Uh, we also are always working on developing what's next for the Argus mobile apps, uh, providing uh, development applications that use barcode scanners as an example. All driver's license have uh, barcode scanners on the back, so we wanna make sure that we utilize that for fast and efficient uh, information gathering and uh, quick response when we have uh, somebody in the field that's stopped. Uh, and then efforts to uh, procure and implement different uh, types of support for the next identification solution for our mobile app. So whatever's next, we wanna be ready. Next slide, please. And the enterprise and infra infrastructure is, is kind of complex. Uh, we have a lot of outside agencies that work with Argus and push data through Argus in order to support our countywide agencies. So when we're looking at uh, this, this map, if you will, here, you have officers in, in field or uh, dispatch communications individuals that are working through the Argus network. Uh, to get information on wants and warrants and photos to make sure that we push that data out. We have to run all of those different servers and all those different agencies through our firewall to make sure that we're compliant, but also keeping that data secure. So our job is to make sure we work with the uh, FBI and CGIS and Cal DOJ and, and making sure we are compliant with their security policies while pushing that out, information out to the and you, uh, officers and users in the field as quickly as possible, but making sure that it's secure data. 
Uh, we're also going to work on uh, preparing for cloud-based ar architecture coming in the future. So 23, we'll have a little piece of that just to make sure that we're, uh, we're keeping up with that as well. Next slide, please. I'm going to provide support and maintenance for about 165 plus physical hosts and virtual servers. Uh, it's a lot of work to make that happen. We have a dedicated system administrator. Uh, we have configured servers and make sure that those uh, the loads are balanced so that we're not over taxing one server or one location over another. We want to make sure that we monitor the database performance and space reliability. And as an example, we've found that we have to upgrade a couple of our servers in the next month or so because of that uh, load balance and making sure that we keep uh, active. We, we can't afford to have the, uh, the data down when they need it the most. Um, and then keeping to uh, the regional databases and make sure that they're up. Uh, we are constantly upgrading um, our disaster recovery and backup systems for the database in case of breaches. So we're, we're very aware of what's going on out there, but it takes, uh, you have to be ahead of it all the time. And that's what our enterprise and infrastructure group will be doing. Next slide, please. And grants, grant funding will be a big support for us. We have uh, grants for mobile application development. Uh, we have uh, grants for regional training program there where we teach the new officers, both in the academy and the field on how to use our uh, platforms. Um, and we're gonna develop a new public facing application so that we can look at crime stats and people can see what's happening within their neighborhoods. Uh, and enhancing cybersecurity through implementing new security tools, including a cybersecurity consultant. We like to test ourselves to make sure that we are not vulnerable. If we are, where can we plug those holes? And then start that cloud computing uh, transition that's gonna be happening here. Uh, and then also managing our live 911 project that, uh, for the participating agencies and rolling that out countywide. Next slide. Hey, thank you. Does that conclude the presentation, uh, Dr. Burke? Thank you. Yes. yes, it does. Okay, thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Carter. I appreciate um, uh, the update. Again, breaking it down, I think really uh, shows the complexity. <laughs> of this budget item, as well as how many people and agencies are really um, integral to the success of, the, of ARGIS, um, as well as um, our supporting programs. One thing I did wanna mention was, um, Dr. Berg mentioned, uh, for every $1 that is invested, $5 comes back to the region. I just wanted to confirm that that was the uh, leverage that we are, um, uh, that I heard that correct. For every one dollar that is invested, five dollars has come back. Yes. So um, last. So for FY twenty three, um, again, we'll have one point eight nine in funding, and the only funding that came from member assessments or the jurisdictions is at two hundred and forty three thousand approximately. So we brought that one point six million in. Outstanding. Um, it's that type of leverage that. When we can bring information, good data that helps us do, as elected officials, our job um, more effectively and getting um, the resources to our public safety personnel um, really helps. So I want to say congratulations on that, that ratio, uh, as well as um, I, I heard through uh, Craig's presentation that there was a return or I don't want to say a discount, but some people were playing double. So uh, they got their money back or got, uh, could you yeah, clarify we, that? Yeah, yeah, Madam Chair, we were able to get them to uh, basically combine forces. So uh, it saved them the money the next year that, that they would have already had in their budget. So yeah, we're again trying to make sure we're efficient, but also want, we don't want anybody paying if they don't have to. And I think that's essential. That's part of the checks and balances that we really need internally. That again, with every uh, organization, we are going to get better and stronger. But when we can see that there is a redundancy, hey, you know what, take the next year off. You're already paid in full. I think that's a good thing, uh, especially when we're able to communicate that to our taxpayers. All right, uh, with that, uh, we'll see if there are any members of the public first, and then I'll go to our PSC members. No member uh, public comment, Chair. Thank you so much. Any members of the Public Safety Committee? No questions here, Chair, other than uh, as this is an action item, right? Yes, it is. Absolutely. I'm very happy to motion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burke. Thank you, Mr. Carter, for your presentation, your hard work, uh, and uh, happy to move the item. Okay. We do have a motion for approval. Do I hear a second? I'll second it. Sotelo Solis. 
Um, all those um, to vote. Oh, wait, do we have any uh, triple checking? Any members of the public wishing to address us on this item? Seeing none, let's call the roll. Chief Sheriff's Association, seat A. Chief K. Uh, approve, aye. Chief Sheriff's Association, seat B is absent. City of San Diego, Vice Chair Campillo. Yes. County of San Diego, Supervisor Anderson. Aye. San Diego County District Attorney, Deputy Chief Investigator Holmes. Aye. East County, Council Member Goble. Aye. Regional Fire Emergency Medical Services, Chief Brainerd. Aye. North County Coastal, Council Member Blackburn. Blackburn, aye. North County Inland, Council Member Frank. Aye. San Diego Police Department is absent. San Diego County Sheriff is absent. South County Chair, Mayor Sotelo Solis. Sotelo Solis, aye. And that motion passes with those members present. Thank you so much. Thank you again to uh, Dr. Burke and uh, Craig for your work on item six, the budget, budget item. We now move on to item seven. It's crime in the San Diego region and public safety budgets. Uh, Dr. Burke will be presenting on this item, but it'll be a uh, presentation on 42 years worth of regional crime trend data from 1980 through 2021 and an overview of public safety expenditures uh, in fiscal year 2020 to 2021. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to staff. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to give a big shout out to all of our local law enforcement agencies and our county departments too, because we would not be able to put out these two publications, which we did in April, are uh, looking at public safety expenditures as well as crime in the San Diego region. And I just wanted to note, um, a big uh, thanks to Chief Kay, who is here representing um, law enforcement today, just so that the other members know there's an academy graduation. I'm not sure which academy number it is, but that's why we don't have San Diego Police Department, the sheriff, or, or seat B here today. So exciting to get some um, new uh, um, exciting officers and, and, and sheriff's deputies out in the street. So that's where our other law enforcement representatives are. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. Um, just offering some historical context. So I've been at Sandex since 1992, and, and just since in the last decade, we've had significant change in public safety in the, in the San Diego region. And I think this is all important when we're looking at data, because when you just look at one or two years and we have the pandemic that we just went through, what looks like big change, um, really when you put it in the whole historical context, it maybe gives a different uh, perspective and point of view. And in 2011, we had AB 109 pass across the state of California, and that changed who supervised, um, uh, as well as housed and, and rehabilitated um, offenders who would have, uh, individuals who would have gone to state prison before, been under state parole, those now came down to um, local jurisdictions. And um, it meant that individuals were in our local jails for a longer period of time, that there may have been individuals with a higher level of need and risk than previously had been under probation supervision, for example. In 2014, um, California voters passed Prop 47, which reduced a number of what would have previously been called wobblers, crimes that could be either uh, prosecuted as a felony or a misdemeanor and made those a misdemeanor, both property offenses um, and drug offenses. Um, and the property offenses, it's up to $950 could be stolen in a day with not no additional of how many times you do that for property crimes, for example. Um, in 2016, voters passed Prop 64, which legalized marijuana for recreational use for those 21 years of age of older. Um, in 2018, we had um, a mandated um, police stop data across the state of California, which changed how officers interacted um, with the public. And then in 2020, we have um, COVID, the pandemic affected um, opportunity for crime, um, uh, how uh, proactive um, law enforcement agencies could do, obviously still wanting to protect public safety, but also considering public health when they went out and had to interact with individuals. And we had Black Lives Matter, a lot more talk about police reform, looking at de-escalation, looking at how do we deal with mental health call service. So just a lot of change. Um, next slide, please. Um, and where we are today, things are opening um, back up, more opportunity for crime. Um, we see a lot more people um, being actively engaged about where they think um, change should be in the public safety um, system. We're now facing um, inflation um, that we haven't seen in a very long time. Um, 
many discussions about um, homelessness, and I believe the numbers just came out yesterday on our homeless count and the increases that we saw. Um, we know mental health challenges. This was a trauma um, from the pandemic that affected many people, and, and I don't think we've seen the end of that yet. And um, for those who work in law enforcement and are tracking some of the crime statistics, we know violence going up across the country. Um, ghost guns, which are guns that can be sold on the internet without a serial number that people put together, are proliferating um, at a greater rate than we've ever seen. So kind of just, again, the context of, of where we are. Next slide, please. So I'll be sharing first some data that we track from our public safety um, expenditures bulletin. And this is unique in that we actually, it seems like it would be an easy report to put together, but we go out to all the different jurisdictions and everyone does their budget slightly differently. So um, we get a lot of feedback that this is one of our most helpful publications to understand where our dollars going to fund public safety locally in the San Diego region. How are there variations across our departments? And how is there change over time? And we do um, apply the CPI to account for inflation. So this is the first time in, in um, almost a decade that we actually saw a decrease when we consider um, the uh, rising cost of inflation. Um, last year um, in, in FY21, there was 2.45 billion spent locally in the San Diego region on public safety expenditures. When we account for inflation, this was 3% lower than in FY20. And when we look at all of our residents in San Diego County, that equates to $734 spent on public safety um, in that last fiscal year per San Diego County resident. Next slide, please. Looking at where the funds go to, um, about one in every $2 does go to local law enforcement, whether it's a municipal police department or the sheriff's department for their contract city services. Um, about one in five to local corrections. That could either be the juvenile facilities um, uh, that are run by probation or um, the sheriff's facilities for adults. Um, about one in 10 um, go to court related. Um, this does not include the state funding for the court, the superior court, but what we actually spend on it locally. Um, about one in 10 to prosecution, either the district attorney or city attorney. 6% um, for probation field services for the um, community supervision they offer to adults and juveniles in the region. 4% to um, the public defender's offices and the offices under the public defender. And then 3% um, to what falls into our other category. That includes the county's public safety group, child support services, um, the Citizens Law Enforcement Review Board, as well as um, Oceanside Harbor Police. Next slide, please. Um, this was an interesting change that we hadn't seen in a while. Um, looking at the one year change in um, how much expenditures each of the categories had, they all had decreases except for the public defender, which had um, an, the only increase that we saw of 3%. Next slide, please. Um, looking across your jurisdictions of um, what percent of general funds are allocated to law enforcement in the region, the regional average is about one in three of every municipality's um, funding. And you can see that varies from 23% in Carlsbad up to 46% in El Cajon, 43% in National City Mayor Sotelo Solis. Next slide, please. Um, I think this is an important statistic also as we look start looking at the crime data, which I'll be sharing next, is um, the number of sworn officers per 1,000 population. And you can see our regional average is 1.29. Um, again, there's considerable variability between Chula Vista, which had 1.04, um, um, Coronado that had 2.15. Um, this does um, consider resident population and obviously not individuals who may visit an area to come into um, for a special event or who may be employed um, in an area such as Coronado. Um, and what I'd like to highlight is that nationally, um, our figure is much lower. It's 2.4 um, nationally compared to 1.29 in San Diego County. So when you consider our crime rates and that we do have one of the lowest crime rates, I really does, do think it speaks to the collaboration um, and the excellent law enforcement that we, we do have here in the region that we have these lower numbers and do have lower crime rates. Next slide, please. Um, so we did put out some special bulletins last year looking at how to, could COVID have potentially affected these crime statistics. Um, and just wanted to highlight those for um, individuals who um, may not have seen those. Um, there was less opportunity for some crimes. When we had bus uh, bars closed down in restaurants, we saw rapes drop dramatically during the pandemic. Um, we saw there may be more opportunity for other crimes. We saw that, um, for example, uh, non-residential burglaries went up when some of the businesses were closed. Um, there were public safety policies to promote social distancing, again, with that less opportunity, more opportunity. Um, service providers were challenged to provide services um, to people in person, um, and then also challenging the digital divide for those individuals who weren't able to um, get services maybe in a telehealth 
um, way. Um, decreased contact with mandated reporters could affect the number of crimes that were reported for child abuse or domestic violence, for example. And then um, less proactive policing, um, as well as um, changes in, in who was detained, which I'll be talking more about in the next um, uh, PowerPoint um, presentation on our ATI study. Next slide, please. And then I think it's also important when we look at these, the statistics that we're still reporting are the UCI crime um, statistics, and we'll be coming um, to an upcoming PSC meeting with more information about this transition to cybers and ibers, which includes over 50 crimes and a lot more uh, higher level of detail about those crimes. Um, but these are the uh, uh, six of the crimes, not counting homicide, that are reported as part of our UCR crime reporting statistics. Not all crime is reported to law enforcement. You can see there's variability. Only about one in four crimes were reported for rape. We know this from a national victimization survey that's con conducted annually by the Bureau of Justice Statistics, where they call households and ask if they were a victim of this crime and did they report it. Um, you can see only 29% of larcenies. Um, not surprisingly, 75% of motor vehicle thefts um, are reported more likely um, due to the need to, to report it to law enforcement for insurance purposes. And then also um, part two crimes, which could include, um, uh, for example, identity theft are not included in these statistics. Next slide, please. So there's four violent crimes, um, homicide, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault. And this uh, shows through 2020, um, how did San Diego, the San Diego region compare to the United States overall, regardless of the size of the, the county or jurisdiction? And you can see in the late 80s, early 90s, we did have a higher violent crime rate compared to the United States overall. Um, in 2020, the most recent statistic that we have for um, the United States, you can see it was 3.99 per 1,000 population compared to 3.45 for the San Diego region. In 2021, our violent crime rate did increase 8% um, to 3.99 per 1,000. Next slide, please. Um, on average, there was about 34 violent crimes reported per day in San Diego County. Um, you can see that about 1% one of, of those were homicides. We had 118 homicides compared to 115 last year. Um, just for some context, obviously one homicide is, is way too many. The lowest number we ever had was 67 homicides in the San Diego region in 2010, and the highest number we ever had was 278 in 1991. Um, rape makes up about 9% um, of our violent crime that's reported, robbery 19%, and then aggravated assaults, which means that a weapon was used or there was great bodily injury, um, represents 71%. Next slide, please. Looking at how 2021 compared to 2020, again, we had an overall big jump in violent crime compared to 2020 when we were in the pandemic. Um, the homicide number, that 115 to 118, is a 3% increase. We saw an 11% increase for rape. And as I indicated um, earlier, we really had a big drop during the pandemic in the number of rapes that were reported. Um, robbery was the only violent crime that actually decreased. It went down 4%, and it's actually at a 42-year low. Um, aggravated assaults were up 12% compared to um, 2020. Next slide, please. Um, this slide shows um, uh, for jurisdictions that we had full um, uh, statistics for. Um, Coronado um, is not included on this slide because they've already um, uh, successfully transitioned to the new reporting system. So they were ahead of the curve. We did, were able to report on them in the mid-year crime bulletin. Um, but for annual, we didn't have their complete year. So we do share statistics, but not the full analysis. But you can see that 16 jurisdictions had more violent crime in 2021 and five had um, fewer. Late La Mesa was the only jurisdiction, and then the rest were um, sheriff's department um, uh, contract cities. Next slide, please. <laughs> Highlighting just a few more violent crime statistics, um, we did see that um, uh, the aggravated assaults that involved the use of a firearm was up 18 percent. All types of aggravated assaults were up, but those with a firearm were up more than any other type. Um, violent crime against seniors, which is defined as um, 60 years of age or older, uh, was up, which I think we'll continue to see as, as that um, baby boomer generation ages, and they, we do have that 60-year um, uh, cutoff for that. Um, increase in domestic violence incidents, we did see that was up 3%, and we actually saw a decrease in um, hate crimes. It was down uh, 7%. Um, last year, we had 81 
hate crimes reported across the San Diego region and compared to 87 in 2020. Um, the number one um, motivation is either perceived or actual race. Um, that's about 70% of hate crimes that are reported in San Diego County. Um, the most common um, race about representing half of those is black African American. Um, but we did have 18% Asian Pacific Islander, which was up 6% from 2020. Next slide, please. Um, turning to property crime, um, about 81% uh, of all crime that was reported in the region was property crime in the um, 2021. Again, a similar re uh, curve where you could see the blue line, um, which is the San Diego region, bluish purple. Um, we had a higher property crime rate um, in the uh, 80s, um, early 90s, which then went lower um, than the United States through 2020. Our, um, that 14.8 was our lowest property crime rate um, since 1980 when we started tracking these statistics. It was up in 2021 to 16.14, which was 9% higher, but was still the second lowest property crime rate we've seen um, since 1980. Next slide, please. Um, we had an average of about 148 property crimes reported per day in the San Diego um, region. That equates to about one in every 62 residents being the victim of a property crime that was reported to law enforcement. The greatest percent is um, larceny, which is two thirds. 21% um, is motor vehicle theft, and then 13% are burglaries. That could either be residential or non-residential. Next slide, please. Um, looking at change in property crime, you can see uh, that 9% that I mentioned. Um, burglary was the only uh, property crime that was down by 2%. Larceny was up 9% and motor vehicle theft. Um, it's hard to get cars and pure speculation on my part if individuals are more likely to be stealing them because they're not out there on the market. Um, Chief Kay or, or Chief Carter may have some thoughts on that, but that was our largest increase in property crime. Next slide, please. Um, again, looking across the jurisdictions, most of the jurisdictions did have increases. Um, eight did have a fewer number. Um, sheriff's jurisdiction cities, as well as El Cajon, um, Escondido, and um, the rest were sheriff's uh, facilities. Next slide, please. And then just some other stats for you because um, you know I love stats. Um, if somebody, if you want to impress somebody at a trivia game this weekend and you want to say how much um, property was stolen per day in the San Diego region in 2021, the answer would be around 668,000. Um, the percent of burglaries that involved no forced entry, which really speaks to not making ourselves easy crime targets, is, was 38%, so about two in five. And we've all heard about theft of catalytic converters. Um, that was larceny. We categorized what type of larceny, and that was the one that went up the most um, in the category of theft of motor vehicle parts. Next slide, please. And so this isn't a crime statistic, but during um, the pandemic, we started reaching out to law enforcement to try to track um, mental health calls for service. Because um, in addition to those seven crimes, law enforcement obviously has a lot other a lot more things on their plate, including responding to calls for service. And so you can see that we have data for now six years. And um, while the average was 105 last year, um, so the number actually went down slightly, um, uh, as you can see here from 2020 to 2021. But it was still um, last year was a leap year with well, 366 days. So the average was still 105 calls per day in the San Diego region, the same as 2020. So those are my statistics and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thank you so much, Dr. Burke. Appreciate the presentation, lots of really good data. Um, I think that last slide, uh, if you don't mind putting it back up about the mental health. Again, recognizing that there's definite need to address, I mean, the only other one that was higher was 2018. And I'm wondering, do we have a comparison of what potentially happened in 2018 to, I mean, we were in the middle of a pandemic in 2020 and still in 2021. Do you know what was the jump in 2028? I'm trying to think. Yeah, I can't, I can't think of any regional issue. I'm not sure if, if Chuck Kay or, or, or Craig might have any thoughts. Um, you know, there's always going to be variation. And I think with a lot of things such as, as these statistics, when numbers go up or down, it may be a bad or good thing. Um, you know, for example, if we see domestic violence numbers go up, that could happen after there's a high, high profile case and people are more likely to report. So it doesn't mean that the number necessarily went up. So who knows if maybe something happened at the time that I can't remember that maybe people were more likely to want to call 
um, for help or for service might be one one reason. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if if uh, the team has any thoughts. Um, no, I I was. I'll go ahead, Chuck. Chief. You know, I, numerically there's some differences, but if you think about the uh, the social conflicts and and concerns across the nation you know beginning 27 20, 2018 the civil unrest um you know those and then rolling into the pandemic i don't think people have gotten much of a break from from a lot of stress okay no i i appreciate both of your perspectives uh, i was just looking at you know again it's uh it's, you know uh you know my new um difference but um, it's also to, you know, when people are asking for help and there is better tracking of data, then that also too does at times skew um, the, the data, but it's, um, it's a good thing that people are using. And I really, I really appreciate this one, um, um, this slide, because it is one, I believe it's mental health month still. And mm -hmm. uh, we do really want to make sure that our community is aware that our uh, public safety still does um, provide these um, um, services for all um, people who do call 911. Okay, uh, with that, I will kick it over. I do have hands raised. Uh, Mr. Campillo, did you have a question um, in the house uh, there in person in the vivo? Nothing for me, Chair, thank you. Okay, I do have Mr. Goble with his hand raised. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Dr. Burke, could you go back to slide four, please? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, there it is. So what's interesting to me, I don't really consider that a drop per se, because 2020 was such an extraordinary year in terms of uh, regional public safety costs. I think there were a lot of overtime uh, things to address public civil unrest. And so I, I think I look at it more to compared to fiscal 19, we're still on that normal upward trajectory. I, I don't know that it's, it's, it's a accurate perception to, for us to believe that it dropped. I think 20 was, was a surge, an unusual surge. And we all know what happened to 2020 nationwide. So that's how I view that slide. My, question either to our law enforcement partners or to uh, Santa Ag staff is, with these increases in property crime and violence crime, I'm told that the county jail population pre-pandemic was about 5,700 per day. Today we sit at about 3,900 per day. And some of that was due to uh, uh, clear it out because of COVID, uh, zero bail, do you think the reduced booking had any impact? Does anybody have an opinion whether the reduced booking and population had an impact on these increases? Great question. Who's going to jump on that one? <laughs> well, I, I, I can, I definitely defer to the law enforcement partners who are here. I can tell you that in the next study, um, we, I will be sharing information about that was really the impetus for the alternatives to incarceration study and seeing um, looking at who was booked into jail, how did the jail population changed, and part of the work that we'll be doing there is trying to look at the individuals who weren't incarcerated, what was their ongoing contact with the system. It's, it's challenging because law enforcement practices also varied during the pandemic, so it doesn't, you know, just because a crime report isn't taken doesn't mean that a crime didn't occur. Um, and so I haven't seen any statistics saying, did individuals who weren't incarcerated, are they the ones that were responsible for, for this crime? But that's something that we are trying to get at. I don't have that data yet, and I'm not sure if, if uh, Chief K or, or um, somebody else, um, um, law enforcement, would like to speak to that. Chief K. Uh, I, I would say anecdotally, until, until that data is collected, I think there are some logical assumptions you can make, beginning with the passage of Prop 47 and the decrease in um, the way certain crimes were handled, the legalization and normalization of some drug use. Um, if we continue with the, the uh, supposition that folks that are addicted to certain narcotics are going to commit certain property crimes, and if certain levels of those property crimes don't result in people being 
either booked into jail or incarcerated, then there are going to be more opportunities for those crimes to be committed. Sounds like the, the opinion is there is possibly a connection until we see more definitive data. I think anecdotally, I think that, you know, for, for us, even though we have relatively low crime, we were seeing repeat offenders. And there were times, and it's not, obviously, the, the Sheriff's Department had to be really careful about their population, especially during COVID, as a safety issue. You know, we were writing people tickets that were in possession of stolen cars instead of putting them in jail. Okay. All right. Thanks for uh, both of your thoughts. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Do we have any members of the public wishing to address us on this item? No public comment. Thank you so much. This was for information only. This was, uh, again, 42 years, I believe was the number that we, we were provided of regional uh, crime data. And I uh, believe all outside of our agenda as well, it is also too on the website for all to enjoy at their pleasure. So we would now uh, like to move forward with item eight. Again, that was for information only. And it is an overview of the county alternatives to incarceration study. Dr. Burke, gear up. Thank you. And I, I, I believe uh, Supervisor Anderson is here. So if he wants to offer any comments on, on this study. So thank you for the county support on this because I do think this is um, an important item to look at. Um, in October, um, Supervisor uh, Tara Lawson Reamer um, New, uh, noticing that the jail statistics were so much lower as um, as the council member uh, indicated, wanted to do a deeper dive and wanted to be a data-driven approach. So they put at the county put out an RFP that Sandeg applied for, and we were this successful applicant for for this study. It's about a one-year study, and um, we signed the contract in late January. So I wanted to come because we are going. I'm going to be going to the board of supervisors with information that's a little bit more detailed than I'm able to share with you here today um, on our report. But I wanted to give this committee an overview um, and also make the plug again for the community survey that we're doing. Um, there's one more week for that to be completed, and I really encourage. Um, you to share it with your staff's departments, any stakeholders you have, because it really is a chance for every resident in San Diego County to, to have a say about what they think is working well, not working well, where there's opportunities for improvement. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as referred, so we um, worked with the county to look at um, jail bookings. So these are the number of bookings into jail um, on a monthly basis, the monthly mean. Um, individuals could be booked more than once, for example, and we have two periods of time that we're looking at for the study pre-COVID, um, which is January 2018 to February 2020, and then during COVID, which is March 2020 to December 2021. And you can see that the month monthly average bookings pre-COVID was um, just over 6,600. Um, you can see the big drop right when COVID um, hit. We went from six, um, just over 6,500 um, down to just under 2,700. And the monthly mean number of bookings during the COVID period was um, just over 3,800. Next slide, please. Um, some of the analysis that I'll be sharing um, with the board and that we shared in an uh, initial interim report that um, was docketed with the county on Monday um, looks at how did the how was there vari variation in who was booked pre-COVID and during COVID, and. Um, so this is looking at those who are booked, regardless of how long they stay, so it's not the jail population overall. But you can see that there was a greater proportion of felonies um, prior, during the pre-COVID period, 46% of those individuals who were booked into jail, regardless of how long they stayed, um, was there for a highest crime that was a felony compared to 59% during COVID. Um, there was a greater percentage of individuals booked for a violent offense um, during COVID compared to pre. Um, there were a smaller proportion of uh, drug offenses and then also a smaller proportion of warrants. Next slide, please. Um, part of what the county wanted us to look at was trying to understand what were the primary policy drivers of this reduced incarceration. And so we did a lot of interviews with stakeholders and we um, tried to summarize it and put it into seven categories. And we have this in that initial interim report, which is um, now posted. And the difficulty and challenges though, is that it was such a fluid situation as we all know during COVID that sometimes policies were put in place locally, then the state changed the policy, either making it more rigorous or not. Um, we had waves of COVID, so policies changed over time. And because many of the policies were put into place at the same time or very close to the same time, it's very challenging to say this 
this um, one factor is related to this percent and drop in bookings. Um, but as I mentioned before, we had reduced opportunity to commit or identify criminal activity. Um, the courts were closed. Um, there were early releases from jail. There were changes in um, bail, zero bail, um, individuals not having to pay any bail at all. Um, modified booking criteria of who could be, um, be accepted into our local jails by the Sheriff's Department. Um, the probation department made changes in their supervision regarding the level of contact and changing um, from more of a um, making sure requirements were being made to try to make sure people were health and safety. And then in the other direction, we actually had um, restraints on who could be transferred to either state custody in prisons or um, mental health facilities um, because they were trying to keep their numbers low. So all those things did um, affect the numbers that I shared previously two slides ago. Next slide, please. Um, so this project um, was very specific in what we were supposed to do. We've gotten feedback already from the community wanting us to look at things outside the scope, so we're compiling that um, information and feedback to provide to the county. Um, what will be shared at next Tuesday's uh, board meeting is really looking at what we did of, of the jail population data. Um, we want to understand who had continued contact, um, referring to the previous question we had, what happened to those individuals who um, did not end up being booked into jail and what was the type of law enforcement contact they had with the system. Um, doing a gap analysis to understand what are the needs of this population, what are the services that are out there, um, what gaps exist regionally, and what are the barriers for service. Um, trying to help the county in identifying proven and promising programs that could be um, implemented or expanded, um, and then also doing a cost analysis. And then underlying all of that um, is opportunities for community engagement and feedback. Next slide, please. Um, we formed an advisory group for this um, for this project, we um, put out a request for individuals to apply. We had 88 individuals across San Diego County um, express their interest. A panel of seven individuals um, representing diverse um, uh, perspectives from around the county inc um, that included two SANDAG staff that were not um, part of the Criminal Justice Research Division, as well as five from the community, ended up selecting 14 individuals. The names of our advisory group um, individuals are here, and these are some of the pictures of the individuals. Um, who are represented on the group. Um, we asked, not everyone was able to share a picture with us, but I wanted to share the diversity that we have here. They're individuals with both lived experience as well as community service providers. Next slide, please. Um, this is the community survey we're doing. So it's, um, it's a survey that'll take about 10 or 15 minutes. It does ask questions about where, um, if an individual's been incarcerated and their perception of need, if somebody's had a family member incarcerated, but also just general questions about um, uh, perception of public safety where improvement needs um, agreement with different types of statements. We do have it available online. Um, somebody could request a paper copy, either in English or Spanish. This is a QR code. Um, if anybody would like any paper copies, but any assistance in, in getting this information out would be um, really helpful. When we looked yesterday, we had about um, 780 surveys, so we're really hoping to get that number up in this last week. We're considering if we extend it for one more week. Um, about 10 percent of the individuals who would return the survey um, did say that they had been incarcerated, and about one in three said that they did have a family member who had ever been incarcerated. Um, other opportunities for community feedback is we're going to be having six community forums um, where members of the public can share their um, views. We also have an email set up on our um, study page at www. Uh, you can see the address there, sandag.org, ATI study. And um, individuals can also fill out a public comment form at any time to make sure that their views are shared in a way that could be passed up to the um, County Board of Supervisors. Next slide, please. Um, this is the data that I'll be sharing on uh, at Tuesday and that is in our first report that really looks at question one, just to kind of give you a sense of what we're trying to do with the data that we have access to, of looking who was booked um, by charge level, charge type and demographics, um, how did length of stay vary over time, um, receipt of services prior to um, being booked into jail and then subsequent um, a contact with the system, the policy drivers I showed you looking at crime trends in San Diego County. Um, there were some questions that we had to answer with proxy or could not be answered though. Um, one was how the jail population had changed um, sentenced or unsentenced and this has been really interesting. When you watch CSI you think there's all this data out there and um, it's a dynamic database system that's constantly changing so when individuals come in they may be booked for one charge and it changes over time um, and it's always updated so we had to um, rely on data that 
been um, turned into the Board of State and Community Corrections. Um, the mapping, we tried to map where the individuals who are booked live, but um, the booking uh, clerk who's taking someone's address is not always doing that for research purposes. So there's a lot of, um, uh, it's not data that's easily cleaned or, or mappable. And then um, wanting to get at underlying needs, there's HIPAA protection rights about needs assessment. So we use some proxies there from our SAM data of trying to understand housing instability, substance use history, as well as mental health needs. Um, and then two questions had been um, posed about um, uh, looking at sentence or unsentence by race, ethnicity, because we had the data at the aggregate, we couldn't answer that. And then um, also length of stay by mental health status, again, because of protecting client um, uh, medical protected in information with HIPAA. Next slide, please. So just for our next steps, we are um, aiming to have the study completed in early 2023. Um, I am presenting to the Board of Supervisors on May 24th, um, hoping to get a larger number of community surveys out and analyzing those and sharing the results, holding the community forums, um, compiling information on best practices and policies, um, looking at law enforcement contact data from Argus with that data from the county to understand um, where individuals are, um, who had ongoing contact in the system, and then also getting um, proxy measures of need potentially um, for those who have been on probation supervision, um, documenting regional service availability and conducting that gap analysis, and then also doing a cost study looking out 20 years to understand um, what would be the potential cost and savings um, to the County of San Diego if um, the original policies are still in place or if individuals aren't booked and what would be the cost of treatment, making some, some assumptions there to look at cost data. And I think that is my last slide. Um, just um, if, again, if anybody's interested, where they can find more information about the survey um, or the study overall. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Cindy. Very much appreciate that. <clears throat> just to clarify, excuse me, the um, data points that you're getting are via the survey, not going into the jail and asking um, questions. Or how, how is the data being collected? Well, so we're using a variety of different methods across the study. So we're using archival data for a lot of our analyses. For these community surveys, anybody can fill it out. So we are trying to, um, the, it, there was a story in the UT this week trying to encourage people. Um, we've worked with the county to try to get it up um, on through libraries and recreation centers. We have worked with um, the sheriff's department to actually go distribute it in the jails as well, as well um, with probation at prob probation community supervision. Um, places. We've had some county staff standing outside the courthouse trying to get some input. So the community survey and getting feedback that way is just one way. We're also doing a lot of archival analysis and, and needs assessment also. Okay. And how many questions are part of the survey? Um, depending, it depends on how many you answer because there's skip patterns. Um, so it's a longer survey if, if for example, the, it would be the longest for somebody who's had lived experience, has been incarcerated, and then we ask questions about what were your needs, what services did you get, what services you didn't get. Um, if somebody does not have that experience, it would be a shorter survey just asking, you know, have you been a victim of a crime? Um, what perceptions do you, do you, what would be your opinion about there's too much policing, not enough policing, there's disparity. So it, it, we, we estimate it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to do the survey. Right. It may even be interesting to ask, you know, some of our um, CPRCs or um, our CERT team members um, that are already involved um, and who work with our public safety personnel and, you know, just community at large might be good even to send the link there. But I will be sharing that on my um, uh, to my team uh, as thank well. You. well. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from members of the dais there in person? No, oh, thank you, Chair. You're good. <laughs> uh, anyone on the virtual dais? Okay. Um, Madam Clerk, do we have any members of the public wishing to address us on this item? No public comments. Okay. Uh, with that, again, that was for information only. Uh, we very much appreciate uh, Dr. Burke's presentation on both seven and eight. Very important information that we really need to get out into the community. Uh, so I'm assuming that the Board of Supervisors is going to use this survey and this report um, to make policy change. 
uh, commit dollars and to um, hopefully um, impact in a positive manner uh, communities uh, that uh, are um, engaged with uh, the court system as well as our jails. So with that, our, our next public safety committee meeting is scheduled for Friday, June, is currently scheduled for Friday, June 17th at 1 p.m. Look forward to seeing everyone then. We are adjourned. It is 2.26. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, everyone. Have a great Thank weekend. You,